Take your Bible, turn to Mark chapter 8. Let's start there. It's good to have everybody here tonight. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, let me give you a, a quick rundown of what I announced yesterday. Some of you have heard it. Maybe somebody hasn't. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell it again. When um, Kenya Television broke the story of our feeding program in Turkana, they interviewed Michael, and um, he was very touched. I, I could see it. I could see it then in the story that um, it had really touched his heart. And what he found was a 10-year-old girl that was raising her, her younger, younger sister, sister and, and two younger young brothers, ranging, ranging in, in age, age from 2 to 10 years old. Ten-year-old girl, girl now is trying to keep these children alive. So she showed up because she heard that there was food out. Now I want you to understand something. That wasn't downtown Turkana we went to. We went to a village. About how far away was that, Michael? Two hours by vehicle. And... Um, because there was a lot of refugees in that area. And so, you know, Michael made this point the other day, who's to say that everything God has done from the very moment we ever had the idea of having a radio station in Kenya, who's to say that that wasn't done just to reach these four children? When you see the, the handiwork of God and how God moves, they say God moves in mysterious ways, that doesn't, even, that doesn't even say it right. Because when you look back at how God brought things about in your life, you just wonder at how, how did God do all that. Well, that's what he did. So anyway, it touched, it touched Michael. And um, when I saw it, I just shook my head. I showed it to my wife. And she was touched by it. And I was talking to her one day and I said... Boy, I'd like to be able to rescue these kids. I'd like to be able to do something for them. Make sure, you know, maybe send somebody from the radio station out once a week to make sure they've got food. Something. Do something for them. And um, so Michael came to me Monday. And he said, I'm... He said, I'm going to ask you to do a favor for me. I said, what? He said, let me go back to Turkana. And he's worried about losing our um, office space where our radio station is. And um, so he seems to think that sitting down and working out a new lease agreement will guarantee our spot in that office. That's the only office, by the way, in that whole building that has air conditioning. And you need air conditioning. So... Um, you know, that was on his heart, and he said, I got something else to ask, too. I said, what? He said, I want to go rescue those children. And I went, absolutely. I said, let me pray about it to make sure that God's okay with this. This, this is what, you know, I'm going to pray about it. I want to say yes, but I want to think about it and pray about it first. He said, okay. I said, I'll let you know before the end of the day. So a couple hours later, I come downstairs and I walk in there where Lisa and the girls and all them are. And they're sitting there with a the phone out looking at pictures of these children, bawling their eyes out. I went, I guess now we have to send him, don't we? Because there's no way I'm going to tell them no. Um... And, you know, God provides. When, 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 when God's in it, God takes care of it. And so, anyway, the plan is he's going to leave when? Friday. Day after tomorrow? Whoa. I'm not packed yet. You taking me? Can I go? Oh, okay. Yeah, I'd have to take you, Melissa, Christina, Lindsay, Alicia, Courtney, who else? I'll take everybody. But 
Uh, Michael's already been in contact with some pastors that we work with out there, and they're checking in on the children. They're making sure they, are, they have food right now. Uh, you know, my biggest fear was he'd get all the way out there and, and show up, and they're going, we don't know where they went. But we're checking in on them to make sure they're still there, to make sure they have plenty to eat. And, um, man. You know, you just think about everything you have here. And you think about four children who have done nothing wrong. And they have nothing. They don't even have parents. And so, um, we are going to uh, find a suitable Christian orphanage to have them placed in. We will sponsor them as a church. So, they will basically be adopted by all of us, all of you. That's, that's a big family. Amen? And so... Um, Bless their heart. Anyway, uh, we'll have them placed in a suitable orphanage. And now, people have asked about bringing them here. To adopt them legally would require one of us going and sitting in Kenya for six months straight. And I understand that. Because they're Boku Harem. You know what that is? It's a Muslim outfit, and it's, it's a group of really filthy, dirty, perverted men who use Islam as a means to rape children, because Allah wants them to have those children, okay? See, uh, uh, Muhammad married a five-year-old girl, so all these Muslim men want to be like Muhammad, and that's what they do. They grab five, six-year-old girls, make them their wife. That's, that's sick. That's perverted. And these cops, Cubby, did you hear about that? They got in trouble for making anti-Islamic statements. Keep making them. It's not that those cops made Islam look bad. Islam makes Islam look bad. That's sick. So anyway, but it's to keep organizations like Boku Haram from going around and just grabbing kids out of one country and stealing them because they've done that in Nigeria they had to rescue somewhere around 50 or 60 or 70 young girls out of this harem in Nigeria. Just it, boy, it makes me mad. So anyway, there's laws that are supposed to prevent that. So it's not supposed to be easy to just go to another country and get all the kids you want. But um, so it, adopting them legally would probably not be what we would look at. But, there is a way, legally, a possibility that we might be able to bring them here. Possibility. I'm not even saying that that's what God wants us to do. I don't know that that's what God wants us to do. But anyway, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with feeling good about doing right. So, uh, I don't feel bad about this at all. And who is to say that God did not, everything that God has done with this church in the past 10 years could very well have been just for the benefit of these four children. You never know. We'll know when we get to heaven. Amen. So, pray for Michael as he leaves. And um, he's going to make a quicker trip than usual going to take care of the business there with the radio station in Turkana to make sure the Catholic Church does not steal our office out from underneath us and to make sure those, those uh, four children are in a good place. So appreciate everybody's prayers and those of you that have reached out and let us know. I've been looking at the comments on the YouTube, little YouTube video I posted and uh, people are doing sort of exactly what we did, you know, when we found out. Let's rescue those children. Um, and when I shared that with my mom, she said, I'm going to cry. Yeah, that's, that happens. So anyway, let's pray for them. Uh, pray for Sister Bonnie tonight. She is in a room and responding to things that are going on right now. 
Um, she still doesn't really understand why she ended up in the hospital, but that's to be expected. So they're looking for a rehab center right now to have her placed in, hopefully maybe uh, up here at Scenic, up in Herculaneum. And so, but that which could be as early as tomorrow, she'll be released to a rehab center. So that's, that's good. To have that kind of surgery and then less than a week be getting out of the hospital uh, is tremendous. That's God being good to Bonnie and Roy both. So continue to pray for them, all right? Mark chapter 8. We're learning uh, the, the, the fundamentals of what we believe. What, what doctrines do we believe? What teachings do we teach as a church? Do, what do we believe in? What, do we st- the, it, what is our religion? And uh, so it's one thing to, you know, break down somebody else's religion and say, this is wrong because they say this, or this is wrong because they believe this. But let's take some time and examine our own religion, learn the fundamentals of the faith. I, you know, some, I've been in church all my life. These things, most of these things I've known for years. But there may be uh, people who, who would say, yeah, I'm a Christian. What do you believe? I'm not sure. I believe the Bible. But what do you believe? So we, we've gone through... Who is God? Uh, and again, you could spend a long time through the Bible just looking at God and all of his aspects and all of his nature and all of his character, what God does, what God does not do, and so on. Well, we tried to cover the main points. We covered last Wednesday night the doctrine of the Godhead, that we believe that God is Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. They are three, and yet they are one, so that's what we believe. We don't quite understand it, but we do believe it. And we accept it. So we know that when we get to heaven, we'll have a new body, a new mind, we'll have a new understanding than what we have down here. But some things we just accept as the simplicity of, of what it is. So Mark chapter 8, we're going to ask the question, who is Christ? Mark chapter 8, verse 27, And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi, And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, or that would be Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. They thought maybe that one of the prophets had been born, had come back from the dead. So verse 29, and he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? His own disciples. Peter answereth and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ, the Christ, not a Christ, not one of the Christ, but the Christ. So, and we'll even have to define that. What does that mean that he is the Christ, the Messiah? What does that even mean? So we'll examine that as we go on. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, uh, what a joy it is and a privilege to come into your house tonight. Uh, Father, to take time out of our week to spend with you, to spend fellowshipping with one another, to, to pray for people, to pray for one another, to pray for ourselves. But Father, to just, to just sit and listen to you. Listen to you teach us. Listen to you guide us and, and maybe teach us something we didn't know or remind us of what we did know and and then remind us of why we knew it, why we believe what we believe. And we just take for granted, Lord, that everybody ought to know who Jesus is and who God is and what the Holy Spirit is and know the difference between Noah's Ark and Moses' Ark. And But Lord, there's so many people now that have never read a Bible. They have heard names, they've heard maybe a story or two, but they don't they don't know what it is. They don't know if they believe it or don't believe it. So, Father, I pray, dear God, that you would use this to train people. Those who already know, use this, Father, to train them to teach others. For those who have never heard this, use this, we pray, to teach them and instruct them in the ways of Christianity. What it is that we believe as Bible believers. What it is that we know in our heart. So, Father, teach us from your word tonight. Instruct us, we pray, in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Uh, Before we get into who is Jesus, let's understand why this is even important. Turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. 
Because there's a couple things that happen. Number one, some people who start out believing in Jesus, when they find something out about him that they don't like, all of a sudden they change their mind and they say, I don't, I don't believe that. And they just kind of, they pull away. Or they won't believe something about Christ that the Bible plainly says. And I give you an example of that. If you look in John chapter 6, uh, let's see here. Verse 57. As the living Father have sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. And we might even have to spend some time on what it means to eat Jesus. What, does that mean we should go to the Catholic Church and have Mass? And Okay. John says no, but who's John? All right? Verse um, 58, this is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, but he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in, in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Now, some people are already following. In fact, quite a, quite a few people are following him at this time and believing his teachings. But then he starts saying things like this. To the Jews especially. So look at verse 60. Many therefore of his disciples when they heard when they had heard this said, this isn't a hard saying. Who can hear this? In other words, we might have a hard time believing this. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? And here's what we know. Some people, when they're learning about Jesus, when they learn certain things about him, they say, I don't believe that. Some people might accept that Jesus was a great teacher and a good person. But if you say, but Jesus is God, they would say, I don't believe that. Now, I don't put much stock at all in anything that C.S. Lewis said, but he said one thing that I would agree with. And he said, either Jesus was God or he was an evil person. And he said, here's why. Because if you say that Jesus is a good person and a good teacher, but then he himself said that he was equal with the Father. If he said that and it's not true, then Jesus is not a good person. He's evil because he's making himself equal with God. So if you say, oh, I believe Jesus was a good man. I believe he was a great teacher, but I don't believe that he was God. But Jesus himself said that he was God, that he and the Father were one. He made himself equal with God. So if he's not God, he's a bad man. Because he said that he was God. He said that he was equal to God. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So you can't have both ways. You cannot say, I think he was a good man, a good teacher, but I don't believe he was God. But he said he was God. So that makes him a bad person. So and this is what's happening here. So he said, verse 62, What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? You know what he's talking about there, right? So what if you see me ascend up to heaven? If you're offended now, wait till then. So then he says, verse 63, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said... Therefore said I to you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. Now look at verse, look at John 6, verse 66. You think that's there by mistake, Cubby? Neither do I. From that time, many of his disciples, 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 <laughs> disciples went back and walked no more with him. You know what they decided in their mind? He's a bad man. He's not a good man. He's not a good teacher. And I'm not following him. Because he made himself equal with God. He said God was his father. And he said he was going to send back up into heaven. There's no way in the world I'm going to follow him. So at that time, they no longer said, I believe he's a good man and a good teacher. Because they quit following him. They walked back and went with him no more. In John 6, 6, 6. Okay? Just stands out. Right? Okay, now turn to... Um, 
Turn to 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. Verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So here Paul is telling us and warning us about someone preaching about a Jesus that does not match the Jesus of the Bible. And he said, some of you will listen to that man. You'll accept what he's saying. You'll, you'll accept the other gospel. You'll accept the other spirit. And you'll accept the other Jesus. So when we say, who is, who is Jesus Christ? Is it important that we properly identify who Jesus really is? Is the Jesus that we believe in the same Jesus as what the Mormons believe in? No. Is the Jesus we believe in the same Jesus that the Jehovah's Witness believe in? No. Is the Jesus we believe in the same Jesus that the Catholic Church believes in? No. And I hope they're listening on Echo Yoke on Radio because it's not the same Jesus. What we found out when you fly into Turkana, up on a high place, right? They tore down the high places back in the Old Testament because they put idols up there. Well, up on top of this big hill overlooking Turkana is this great big statue of Jesus that the Catholic Church has up there. They put an idol up on a high place, exactly what God told them not to do in the Old Testament. That's what they did. And I'm telling you, that is not my Jesus. Not the same one. This one they got over here hung on every wall and every office and every patient room over here at Jefferson Memorial is not the same Jesus that we teach and believe in over here. It's not the same one. They accuse us of being wrong. We're accusing them of being wrong. So let's identify. And what other religion has a counterfeit for their prophet? Does Mohammed have a counterfeit? Is there someone going around teaching the anti-Mohammed? Is there an anti-Buddha? Well, maybe it would be Jesus, okay? <laughs> but that's my point. Here's, you got one religion in the world where there is a concerted effort over thousands of years by thousands of people to draw people away from the real Jesus to a counterfeit one. I don't think you have that in any other religion. But you have it in Christianity. And we were warned about it. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 24, Lo, if any man say, I am Christ, believe it not. Lo, here is Christ or there, believe it not. Many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. So we're warned numerous places that we need to know how to identify. So let me give you this little scenario here. Um... Let's say we're alive on the earth and all of a sudden the Antichrist is revealed. And the Antichrist tells everybody, I am Christ. I'm Jesus. I'm the Messiah. I have brought the Christ consciousness to this earth. We're going to make everybody one with the Christ and I'm him. Would you be able to know the difference between the fake Jesus and the real one? Would you be able to know the difference? You're nodding your head, so I'm going to ask you. Tell me, how, how would you know, Rose? Not bad from a blonde, I'm telling you. That was pretty good. Listen to this gal. Come on up. No, don't do that. John? Okay. Well, that was an easy answer. Oh, they said what I was going to say. Sure, they did. <laughs> turn, to, turn to John 3.16. Very quickly. 
And then we'll, we'll look at, uh, this is, I've given you all this without my notes. Now we'll get into my notes. John 3.16. Jesus, um, all through the four Gospels, teaches us how to identify the difference between him and the false Christ. In many places, in, in this place here, he says, oh, let's start in verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So one of the things we just learned something here. Let's say you're brand new and you don't know who Jesus is. So the first thing you've learned here is he is the only begotten son. The only begotten son. Now, I'm not sure that I could explain that. But I believe it. So when Jesus uses this term, I'm the son and God is my father, does he really mean that? I mean, is that literally what, how it is? Yes, it literally how it is. And this is what made the Jews upset. He identified himself as the son of God, the son of God. And so he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is, this is who he is. Now, this is why he is. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So let's break this down and let's, let's just look at some very important points that he makes here. Number one, that Jesus is here because God loves everybody. How bad do they have to be before God stops loving them? There is no such limit. God loves sinners. Number one. Okay. Number two. He's the only begotten son. That and then, you know, you look in verse 17. You can see then a, a double witness to that. God sent not his son. So we see that Jesus literally is the son of God. God is his father. And... Uh, I don't like much of what this guy says either as a late night talk show host, but he had an atheist on his program saying, you know, that people misunderstand Jesus that, you know, just because he said he's the son of God, that didn't mean that he was God. You know, you could say you're a son of God, but that doesn't really mean you're God. And the guy said, well, hang on a second. He said, the son of a duck is a duck. And I went. That's really good. Son of a duck is a duck. <laughs> and he said, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck and rises from the dead like a duck, it's a duck. Amen. <laughs> and I went, not bad from a heathen. Okay. So God is his, son, is his father. He is the son. He was sent to the world so that the world would not be condemned in their sin, that they would have eternal life, everlasting life in the next life. And the condition of that salvation is applied to those who believe that. Those who believe. So just in those three verses there, some very simple things. But then he also points us back then in verse 14 to the Old Testament. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus says in a different place, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So... That kind of teaches us about evangelism and the tactics we use. Should we try to exalt ourselves or our church to draw people to salvation? I don't think so. But you know, that's how a lot of churches do it. They send out pamphlets about their church and what their church does and what their church offers everybody. And if you come to our church, then we will take your kids off your hands and we will give them soda pop and popcorn. And, and then we will give you free coffee and we'll let you come dressed however you want to and we'll play music you like. They're selling themselves to get people. But that's not what Jesus said do. He said, lift me up. If you exalt me, I'll draw all men unto me. Now think about it. Did you come to the Lord Jesus Christ 
because you wanted to join a church. You came to Jesus, why? Because he made you an offer you couldn't refuse. That is, he will wipe away your guilt. He will take your sins away. Give you a brand new start in life. You can have it all over again better than it ever was. And that's what it means to exalt Christ. Lift him up. He'll draw people to himself. We don't have to. We just teach them about Jesus. Let them decide. Because Jesus said earlier, he said, back in John 6, he said, therefore now you understand that it wasn't you that came to the Father, it was the Father that drew you to the Father. So God is the one who does the outreach, the evangelism. He just tells us to tell the story. Some people will like that story, some people won't. And the people that don't like it, if God doesn't change their mind, how do you think you can? Because some preachers and some people try it to change somebody's mind and they give in because you put pressure on them, but they're not going to stick with it and they're not going to last. And all you've done is created somebody that's made a mess out of a church and more than likely they made a, a worse mess out of their own lives. Because they tried it, they tried it the wrong way and they said, I'll never go to church a day in my life again. That's happened before, by the way. So, all right. So he tells us, you know, go back in the Old Testament as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. So what we're going to do is we're going to go, we're going to start in Genesis. We're going to kind of work through, we're not going to touch every verse and every chapter, but we're going to look at some ways that Christ is seen all the way back in the Old Testament. So Genesis chapter 1. Notice this. And this kind of connects it with what we taught last week tonight about the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. So in Genesis 1, 26, And God said, let us make man, let us make man in our image after our likeness. One, two, three. God is speaking to himself, and he's speaking to himself in the plural. By the way, the Hebrew word, there's several Hebrew words for God. One is Jehovah or Jah. Adonai means Lord. And Elohim is a common name in the Old Testament Hebrew for God, Elohim. Well, this is interesting because El literally is the Hebrew word for God, just a generic God, El. But he calls himself Elohim. And when you add I am to a Hebrew word, it's like adding S to an English word. It goes from being one to being more than one. So El becomes Elohim. He is a plural. Bye, Roland. See you, buddy. We'll have a candy meeting after church, all right? So El becomes Elohim, plural. But he's not many gods. He's still one God, but he's... He's the God that's plural. I don't know how to explain it any better than that. Okay? But that's what you see here. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Does it three times. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 says of Jesus, for in him, Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he said, if you want uh, the Holy Spirit, that spirit is my spirit. Paul said it was the spirit of God's Son in us. When we are saved and born again, we have the spirit of God's Son in us crying, Abba, Father. Meaning the spirit in us, when we call to God, we don't just call God, God. And I, I started doing this years ago. I caught myself almost never referring to God as my Father. And now when I pray, whether I do it out loud or just to me, I am more often referring to God in that personal way. He is my father. And I worship him that way. I follow him that way. I love him that way. I serve him that way. In every, thank you, God, for that. I like it when I get a little kick of light. So anyway, God's making me look good here. Anyway, so but I, I worship him that way. So here's Jesus and in him dwelleth 
the fullness of the Godhead. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you have my spirit, then you have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the spirit of God's Son. And they both say the same thing. So, we learn then that Christ is man. Not any other gender. Absolutely not any other gender. And by the way, while we're in Genesis, let me deal with this. Uh, what is that, verse 26? Because you still find people all over, the, all over the internet who are insisting that the God of heaven has dual genders in him. That God is both male and female. Don't you believe that? Number one, I'll ask you to read me that verse. In fact, I need three of them. Give me three verses where God said, I am woman. Never happened. Ever. We'll say, well, God created man in his image and God created man, male and female. So God must be male, female. Uh, you're not reading that right. In fact, you probably got some other translation. Because there in verse. Um, where was we here? Verse 27. So God created man, man, that's masculine in his, that's masculine, own image. In the image of God created he, that's masculine, him, that's masculine, male and female created he, that's masculine, them, that's plural. You understand what I'm teaching you? That at no time does it ever say that when God created man, he created him both male and female. Because you see the transition in that verse. In God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he, him, speaking solely of Adam, in the masculine, in the singular. But then he says, male and female created he, God, them, both of them. One was male and one was female. You never see God referred to as a woman. Ever. So, you reject then the teachings of Kenneth Copeland because he believes that. Rick Warren because he believes that. Probably Beth Moore because she believes that and countless others. And you know what that you know where they get it, Cubby? They get it because the modern translations have reduced the masculinity of God so much, especially the NIV has reduced the masculinity of God so much. And this is done by design so that now they've even changed the wording of verse 27. I don't know exactly how it's done. You can go to blueletterbible.org and look at Genesis 127 in the NIV and you'll find there's enough wiggle room there so that it kind of makes you think that maybe God is male and female. The God I worship isn't, but I know another God that is. Male and female. Uh, think of Genesis, or excuse me, Revelation 9. When the fifth trumpet sounds, these devils come up out of the pit. They have the face of man and they have the hair of woman. They're omnigendered. So what is the spirit then of all of this that's going on in our country? That's trying to promote. This is LGBTQ month. Everywhere else except here. There'd be no rainbow flags floating around our church. Amen. Okay. That's wicked. Amen. That's wicked. There, I don't want to get into that stuff. But anyway, that's not our God. And that's not our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? All right, Genesis chapter 2. Turn there. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Jesus then is the first man. Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So how did God do this? How did God make man alive? Did he touch him on the finger like Michelangelo painted on the ceiling? He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So look at 1 Corinthians 15. I have it up on the screen. You want to take notes? 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. Now, herein lies the difference between Adam and Jesus Christ. Adam was made. Jesus wasn't. So that's one of the attributes we'll look at about Christ. 
He always is, always was, always shall be. So the last Adam, the first man Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. You know what that means? What does that mean? In fact, I'll just ask you what does that mean? A quickening, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Huh? Alive? I don't want to tell you you're wrong, but you're not getting it. Look at what it says. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a, not just alive, the one who makes men alive. A quickening spirit is a spirit that quickens people. He's the one that gave you your life back. You were dead in trespasses and sins. You were like Lazarus. And here's Jesus. And he doesn't have to touch Lazarus. He doesn't have to jump on him. He doesn't have to do chest compressions on him and hooking him up to a bunch of machines. Jesus simply speaks. Lazarus come forth. And Lazarus was made alive just like that. Four days dead. I don't want to tell you what happens to a body after four days. But it's bad. And very smelly. You want me to describe it? No? No? I won't. It's bad. It was so bad that the Jefferson County deputy who was outside the house when we went and picked up this old guy's body, he had already been in the house to see that somebody had died in there. The neighbors could tell. Poor old man, didn't have any family. Nobody knew he had died. He'd been there four days. Nobody knew he died. The deputy said, unless you see a gun or a knife sticking out of him, I don't want to know it. So, okay. So, didn't happen to see anything like that. So just no guy died in his house all alone. What a shame. Amen. But anyway, that's what Jesus does. That's the difference. Adam had to be made alive. Jesus is the one who makes people alive. Amen. So the last, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How be it? That was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural and afterward that which is spiritual. So you understand that, right? The Old Testament comes first. New Testament comes second. The New Testament is carnal and natural. The Old Testament references the old man. The New Testament references the new man. It's spiritual, not carnal. So the carnal has to come first. You have to live in the corruption of this life first. Then you get what's spiritual. So, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. So, I mean, that's what we just learned. God formed Adam out of the dust of the ground. But where did Jesus come from? Heaven. His being and his nature is completely different than Adam's was. All right? So he's the first man. Luke chapter 3. Oh, I like this one. You can follow me up on the screen here. He is the Son of God. So in Luke chapter 3, the Bible gives the lineage. And this is what we're doing is we're comparing the Old Testament with New Testament. In this case, we're comparing Adam with Jesus. How Adam is a profile of Jesus or a type of Jesus. Luke chapter 3, verse 23, Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. And I skipped over several verses, 13 of them about, something like that, 14, 15. Because you get on down to which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So follow this. We have Adam who was created directly by God. He was not born of a woman on this earth. He was created directly by God. So it does leave the question, Courtney. Did Adam have a belly button? I don't either. If he did, it was full of dirt because that's what he was made out of. 
Anyway, which was the son of God. So Adam in the Old Testament was a son of God, a type, a prophetic picture, a profile. So then we have, and this is the first occurrence, Daniel 3.25, first occurrence in your Bible of son of God. And notice, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt. And the form of the first is like the son of God. First time he ever appears in the whole world, in the history of the world. First time he appears literally as the son of God. And it wasn't the prophets who recognized that. It was Nebuchadnezzar who recognized that. What do the, what do the other translations say here? Anybody know? A son of the gods. I taught you that, Hyun Mi. She's, she had some Korean Bibles. They were neat to go through. And she had a Korean Bible. And I, I said, well, let me look at it. Now, I don't read Korean, naturally. So I said, you know, 1 John 5, 7. Is that in your Korean Bible? Looked it up. Sure it was. It was there. She said, these three. I went, yeah, that's right. And I said, Daniel 3, 25. I said, he's the son of God in there, right? She read it and she said, yep, he's the son of God. I said, it's a good Bible. I'll take it. The form of the fourth is like the son of God. It's the first time he's ever identified that way. And all the new translations corrupt that, every one of them. They never call him the son of God in the NIV or the New American Standard or the Revi or New English Version or the Message Bible. They never call him that. They call him a son of the gods. Even in the Swahili Bible, the old Swahili Bible had it right. The new Swahili Bible, they corrupted it. Matthew 4, 3. This is the first time it's mentioned in the New Testament. When the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, think about this for a minute. Here's the devil. And what does he do? You learn his character by studying him, his profile, how he works. Because the first time the devil shows up in the Old Testament is in Genesis 3. And he's questioning, did God say this? Yea, hath God said. He's doubting the word of God. The first time you see him in the New Testament, what is he doing? Doubting the Son of God. And he says to Eve, Yea, hath God said. Did God really say this? Then he's saying right to Jesus, if thou be the Son of God. Well, I'll tell you how stupid the devil is. Because when you look in Matthew chapter 8, all the other devils know he's the Son of God. Behold, they cried out saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come to, hither to torment us before the time? They knew who he was. But Satan, he's full of pride. He's like people we know, or maybe even you, who never admit you were wrong. So I'm, I'm going to say something to you. And we're going to go to prayer in a minute. It is like Satan. To have so much pride in you. To never admit when you did wrong. And there are just some people in this world. Who will look you in the eye John. And they will lie through their teeth and never admit that they did something wrong. Not even when you know it and they know you know it, they're never going to admit it. That's Satan right there. That's Satan I'm telling you. You know what? It takes a bigger man to admit his mistakes. It takes more strength. To tell everybody your weaknesses. It's weak to pretend that you're strong when you're not. And it's wicked to know you did wrong and never admit it. Amen. So who's Jesus? He's the Son of God. Amen. He's the one. Adam was the one who needed life. Jesus is the one who gave him life. Now, here's what I believe. I believe we know that all things were created by Jesus Christ. So when it says in Genesis 1 that the Lord, or Genesis 2 that the Lord God formed 
Adam out of the dust of the earth? I believe that that was Jesus Christ literally doing that. Is what I believe. Because we, we do see a sort of a, a, a difference in their aspects and what they do. God is the Father who always is on the throne. And I think the act of creation itself was done by Jesus Christ. And I think when it says the Lord God formed Adam, I think that was Jesus. And I think when his nostrils were filled with the breath of God, I think that, I think that verse is telling us that Jesus is the quickening spirit, the one who blew that breath. Remember what Jesus did to his disciples? He went, receive you the Holy Spirit. So I think that Jesus is the one blowing the breath into Adam, making him a living soul.